Welcome. Hear the good news and proclaim it. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Friends, my name is Jeffrey Zalatoris. I'm the pastor at Harmony United Methodist Church, and I welcome you again this week to our virtual online worship service. This is our service for April the 26th. This morning I am joined with Elaine Stuckey providing music, with Kristen Shriver providing our liturgy readings, and David Elliott for our technical production. And this morning I want to remind you that we are continuing in this season uh, and we're going to continue to offer our worship online for the next couple of Sundays, at least until the middle of May. So at least two more Sundays, uh, you can continue to receive our worship through Facebook and on the website and on our YouTube uh, channel. Um, we will continue to offer these until we are able to gather together in the sanctuary. We will certainly let you know when that day comes. Also, I invite you to continue to, uh, to consider coming and joining our virtual uh, Zoom Wednesday night prayer study. Um, this next week will be our second Zoom gathering, and you are invited to join in. Information will be available on the website of the church. So friends, I invite you this day to join us in this time of worship. And if you have a special prayer request, a joy or a concern that you would like to lift up during this service, feel free to type that into the Facebook feed as we go through the morning. Friends, let us prepare our hearts for worship through music. Praise the Lord, Christ is risen. Through Jesus, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and crowned him with glory. You were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. You have been born anew through the living and enduring Logos, the Word of God. By your obedience to the truth, you express genuine love for one another deeply from the heart. With gifts such as these, 
Shall we not then live in reverent awe of the living God? Christ is risen. Alleluia. Let us pray. God of all that is seen and unseen, receive our praise and thanksgiving. Creator God, who sets the order of life and the laws of nature, we praise you for your marvelous works. Through your Holy Spirit, you have brought us assurance and faith and meaningful living. Through Jesus Christ, you have prepared the table of forgiveness for us and shown us a path for living in accord with your love. Alleluia. Amen. chapter 2, verses 14a, 36 through 42. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. 
Our Gospel lesson today is taken from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, verses 13 through 35. Please listen and read along. Now on that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you walk along? They stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body there, they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered there. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Thanks be to God. One time I was walking on the streets of Cincinnati, and a stranger walked up to me and just started talking to me. Has something like that ever happened to you? A, a stranger just appears out of nowhere and strikes up a conversation with you. And this, this person who came up to me, he, he began by asking if I had a moment to listen to him. And at that moment, I felt a little irritated and a little afraid and also a little curious because I wanted to be somewhere else and I had something in mind to do that afternoon. And I'd assumed I'd get a three or four minute long mini version of his life story before he might ask me and plea for some cash for the day. Well, he began his story, and the next thing I knew, I was enwrapped in an hour-long lesson or series of lessons as he spoke about God and his faith and Jesus as his Savior. He spoke of Benjamin Franklin and the American Revolution. He spoke of Winston Churchill and quoted from Churchill's speeches. He spoke of martial arts and skill and the discipline you need in life. An hour later, and I've had three or four lectures 
of a college professor, it felt like. It was no longer just a three-minute conversation or person's story. It became lesson after lesson. And yes, at the end of all of that, he did hold his hand out asking for some money. But you know, after an hour-long lesson he'd given me, I felt no qualms about handing him some money out of my wallet that day. Frankly, I felt honored to pay the man for his time and his wisdom. Strangers, you never really know what stories are gonna tell you. One day, a stranger met two men walking. It was the first day of the week and the two men were walking away from Jerusalem. They didn't seem very bothered by the presence of the strangers, and, but they weren't overly forthcoming to welcome him either. And then the stranger asked them about their conversation. And they must have looked at him a bit oddly in that moment, for they figured the events of the previous days were things everyone there and around Jerusalem had heard about and knew about. But they decided they would give him their version of the story of the previous days. That a man, Jesus the Nazarene, had come to Jerusalem with a crowd. And they, the celebration for the Passover seemed to be magnified by the presence of Jesus entering Jerusalem and spending his days there. But then Jesus was taken by the guards of the high priests. He was tried and he was crucified and buried. But then they spoke of that same morning, the same day as they were walking with this man, some women in their group had visited the tomb where Jesus was laid to rest, and the women had given their testimony to the disciples who were walking, that they saw the tomb was uncovered and it was empty. The two men still seemed somehow astonished that this stranger who approached them did not seem to know the story. Let us pray. Holy God, open our eyes to see your light that dispels darkness. Renew our faith, anchor our hope in you, and revive our love through your word and our prayerful reflections. Through Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Friends in Christ, today we continue the celebration of the Easter resurrection. We continue to proclaim the risen Christ and the Easter hope. It is the hope of salvation that Jesus brings forth. And today marks the third Sunday of Easter in our Western Christian calendar, and we are well on the road to Pentecost. So I submit to you this day that the Easter season reflects the movement from the tomb and the resurrection of Jesus to Jesus' ascension on that day of Pentecost when he sends the Holy Spirit to the disciples. Like Lent and Advent, the Easter season has elements of a season of preparation, and during those days, the disciples were indeed preparing themselves. They were preparing to transition from being followers to becoming leaders of a faith movement. So what did those early disciples do during those seven weeks from Easter to the Pentecost to equip their faith, to anchor their hope to stay in love with God? For they had just come through a week of tumultuous events of Jesus' capture and crucifixion and his death and resurrection. Our lessons, friends, this morning point us to the means used by these disciples. In the Acts of the Apostles, we heard how the disciples preached repentance and God's forgiveness. We heard how 3,000 were baptized that day, and we read how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. These, then, are the means of grace. Acts of devotion and spiritual discipline that followers of the way of Jesus used to stay in love with God. These were the actions taken by the disciples to equip their faith and anchor their hope in God despite the events that had just transpired. And these were also the actions taken by that crowd of 3,000 who were newly baptized 
as they began to practice these means of grace right after the Pentecost. Clearly, the disciples had been teaching ways to stay in love with God to their disciples and to the baptized. Now, in the other lesson today, we were reminded how the disciples began that Easter day and they were still sequestered, locked away in a house, in a room. For us today, we are not unlike those disciples. We may feel a bit locked away in a house or in a room, sequestered from friends and family. And it may help us today to understand how the disciples transitioned from hiding in a locked house that first Easter to being prepared and making open and public proclamations of God's greatness on the day of Pentecost. For the disciples would take 50 days from that Easter, the Passover celebration in the Jewish calendar, to the holiday of Shavuot in the Jewish calendar, what we call a Pentecost in the Christian calendar. The disciples would take those 50 days to shore up their weakened faith, revive their commitment to the love of Christ, and they would reclaim hope in their lives. Because that Easter morning, the disciples were still without faith, love, and hope. They were separated from one another, yet they would come together again. And they would do what was required of them to equip themselves in the faith. The disciples needed those seven weeks to transition from being almost completely dependent on Jesus, who served them as master and teacher and mentor, manager and guide, into fully accepting their call and their vocation to ministry. A calling of leadership, of teaching, of service, and of being obedient to God's call to them to live as missional disciples. On that first Easter, the disciples needed encouragement and reassurance, and they received from Jesus the evidence to get them back on their feet and out of that locked house and back on the pathway towards becoming full disciples. But they did not rush out of the door immediately. They did not pick up right away. They just weren't ready. They'd just gone through a traumatic week. And by grace, Jesus would give them the time to renew their faith, would give them the time to prepare themselves to take on their vocation before he would ascend and depart from them. Because the disciples needed to be refreshed, and to slowly return to the fullness of their faith. In this, we may recognize something of our own situation today as we are asked to take time apart, and that when we return to life on the other side of the coronavirus pandemic, we will move back into that slowly, not rushing in. The disciples needed 50 days to get back on their feet, we may need that long and perhaps longer before we as a society are prepared to return to a semblance of what was normal. And we may need that long or even longer for individuals to feel comfortable stepping out of the house and moving about in public places again. But we have an example in the Acts of the Apostles. God gave time for the disciples to return to that faith they had, to prepare themselves to take on the mantle of discipleship and leadership. God gave them time. And God will see us as well through this time. And it can be a time of renewal for us if we let God journey with us and if we let God guide us. You see, God guides us when we participate actively engage in the means of grace. But if we just sit idly by, expecting God to pour faith and hope into us, we are sadly mistaken. The means of grace are active, they are participatory. If you or I want to grow in faith and hope, you and I need to commit to that. We must engage spiritual disciplines to grow, to grow in hope, to grow in faith and in love in any season, 
and especially in a season of uncertainty where we are. Both of our scripture lessons today point us to the means of grace to equip our faith. So let's return again to that gospel lesson. After the two disciples had told the stranger what their thoughts were about the events of the past days, the stranger surprised them as he told them, Oh, how foolish you are! And then he began to describe to them all the lessons. They walked mile after mile, a seven-mile distance from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and along the way the stranger recited scriptures. He taught these two disciples how to interpret the scripture, reading all the way back to Moses and through the prophets. He was able to share with the disciples how, through Jesus, the wholeness of the law and the prophets had been fulfilled. And through it all, even though these were disciples of Jesus, they still did not recognize him. Perhaps they were still clouded by the trauma and the events of the days that had happened. Perhaps Jesus intentionally hid himself from them. We don't truly know. We just know their heads weren't in it at the time. Their hearts weren't in it, and their hands weren't in it. And I suspect it was not just those two disciples who were distant. It was probably all of the disciples who had lost their heads and hearts and hands for Christ. Their faith lives needed a recharging. And the recharging, at least for these two disciples, began with that lesson, which is our first lesson on engaging the means of grace to strengthen faith and hope. For Jesus shared the scriptures, he taught and interpreted the scriptures for those two disciples. Jesus did not need to gather in a large church. He did not need a mega church setting in order to teach the scriptures, in order to worship with these two. For we know that where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus says, I'm there with you. That is sufficient for us to worship and to pray and to study the scriptures and to be recharged by the Holy Spirit. So back on that road to Emmaus, worship was practiced by walking and talking. Jesus led them in worship and the study of the scripture. It did not require a fancy building with stained glass and ornate carvings. It required a few people whose hearts were open to God, whose heads were listening for God, and whose hands were open to obeying God. So even when we don't meet together in a church building, we can still worship and pray and study scriptures at home, in phone groups, on a Wednesday night Zoom gathering, other media resources we can turn to to apply ourselves to study scripture. Studying scripture equips our faith and strengthens our hope, just as it did those disciples on the road to Emmaus. Now our second lesson on means of grace that day comes from this, that Jesus was sharing in fellowship with those disciples. They walked for hours. And I imagine that their time of studying scripture and sharing in the Bible study included some personal conversation as well, some experiences they had as they walked together. Then the disciples invited Jesus in for a meal, a time of fellowship and gathering. Again, for us, even in this season, we can fellowship in new ways. We can fellowship with family at home. We can fellowship by telephone, conference call, Facebook. We can even fellowship through writing cards and letters. It is through Christian fellowship, indeed, that we can equip our faith and anchor our hope in Jesus Christ. Finally, from the Gospel lesson, we see how Jesus offered the sacrament to the disciples. Jesus broke bread with those two disciples, even though they probably were not among the disciples who shared the Passover supper with him. But that night, Jesus broke bread with the, these two disciples, and their eyes were opened. 
In that moment of sharing in the breaking of the bread, the disciples recognized Jesus for the first time that day. And in that moment, they also realized that the words that they'd been told, the stories from Mary and Mary and Simon Peter about the empty tomb, those stories were all true. Sharing the sacraments also equips us for faith and strengthens our hope. And this Easter season, we will have to be even more creative in sharing of the sacraments, for we are not gathered in the church to celebrate the Holy Eucharist or the communion together. We also cannot celebrate a baptism or the affirmation of baptism in person. Yet in this season, let us look forward to the time when we do gather together and can celebrate the sacraments again. But as we wait for that day, we can recall the liturgies of the communion of the baptism. We might pray these words, the words of praise that we say in our communion service. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We can equip our faith even through affirming the words of the mystery of faith, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We may not be able to share in the sacraments together at this time, but we are invited to keep the sacraments in our remembrance, that these are part of the unfolding drama of God's creation, the work of God that continues to blossom around us. And until we gather again, may the memories of our community worship and a fondness for the sacraments sustain your faith and your hope. Friends, as Christian disciples, we are familiar with worship and prayer and fellowship and studying the scriptures and the sacraments, that these are the very lifeblood of the church, these are the lifeblood of the body of Christ. And in this gospel lesson today, we saw how Jesus shared these means of grace and how the disciples were revived and recharged through sharing the means of grace with Jesus. And I trust that these means of grace also share, were shared with the disciples during those seven weeks following Easter. For indeed, in the Acts of the Apostles, we read how the early disciples, even the 3,000 who were baptized on Pentecost, how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and their prayers. The early disciples practiced these means of grace just as Jesus had taught to the other disciples. We have inherited these in our life too. We can share these means of grace to prepare ourselves and to stay in love with God. We have received the means of grace. We have inherited these of worship, of studying scripture, of fellowship, baptism, and holy communion. We use these to equip ourselves and anchor our hope. We use these to transform ourselves into the vessels of God's mercy and grace and love for the world. Therefore, today I commend you, continue practicing these means of grace to keep your faith and your hope secure. And by these means of grace, we too may carry the thread that began when Jesus shared his story with those two disciples on the road of Emmaus. And today we carry that forward so that others may know Christ is risen. Amen.
intercession this day. For the health of loved ones and strangers during this pandemic, and for the healthy, measured return to the fullness of community life, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the continual awakening of the Holy Spirit's gifts, by which Christ-like acts of mercy and grace may reveal the God, the kingdom of God, we pray. Christ, have mercy. For all of us who have sinned and fallen short of the image and likeness of God, to be convicted, to confess our sins, and to be cloaked in God's forgiveness, we pray. Lord, have mercy. For the reverent stewardship of God's creation and the responsible use of the earth's resources, we pray. Christ, have mercy. And for the joys in our life that we lift before God, and for the concerns weighing on our hearts, minds, and souls, we take this moment to call them to mind. Bless our petitions with your compassion, we pray. Lord, have mercy. Amen. Friends, I, I have to tell you I am impressed with your generosity as a congregation for continuing to strengthen our ministries and our mission through your gifts, your offerings. You have allowed us to continue to receive food items in order to give to those in our community who are struggling in this season, and you continue to uplift the ministry through your gifts and offerings. At this time and through the week, if you are able, uh, please go to the website and make an offering through our online giving portal or send in a check to the church that we may continue to offer the ministries and service to God. Let me offer then at this time our offertory prayer for this week. Holy God, we offer you our thanks for showing us that your love knows no bounds and for blessing us abundantly. We are a grateful people and we give you our offering that you may bless it and transform it to strengthen our mission to love one another, the community, and the world. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
confidence as the body of Christ, redeemed by his grace, the prayer that Jesus taught us. Let us say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends in Christ, let the world ring with the joy and the good news that Christ the, our Lord is risen. May the God who creates and redeems and sustains us bless you, forgive your sins, and secure your hope in eternal life. Amen. Mm -hmm.